Good to go. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Walsh. I am acting SMC um, liaison today for our officers who were not able to join us because they're all traveling. Um, we'll have our short business meeting and then we will introduce our speaker today. The mission statement of the safety and maintenance council is to provide members with the best possible resources to enhance current and future safety and maintenance processes and to recognize safety and maintenance professionals for their achievements. The intent is to educate and support membership to improve the safety of employees as well as the public. I want to thank our SMC sponsors, JJ Keller, Marvin Johnson and Associates, Vertical Alliance Group, General Truck Sales, and Omnitrax, the Solera Company, as well as UPS. We'd like to also welcome our newest SMC members today, Bill Koopman from FedEx Ground, Justin Sellers, Taylor Distributing, Bill Blake, GCI Slingers, and Windus Fugate III, GCI Slingers. Next week is our SM or our Transportation Summit. There are about a dozen seats remaining for the summit. Full registration is $295. All of the details are on our website. There is still opportunity um, and a special for SMC members to participate on Wednesday morning for the three sessions through lunch for $75. Those three sessions are a virtual scale visit that was recorded at the Richmond Scale House for us a month ago, and it will be moderated in person by Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Division Trooper Major Smithers and then Captain Carter or Captain Barr with a Q&A session at the end. We'll also have a session from Rebecca Brewster from Attree on understanding zero emission vehicles. And lunch will be capped off with a presentation from Inside Indiana business creator Gary Dick on business in Indiana and the logistics industry. Upcoming SMC meetings and scale visits March 2nd. We are having a webinar uh, regarding truckers against trafficking. Um, we are doing that with the Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Division and the National Transportation Center. All the information is online. Feel free to web register for that webinar. Our next SMC meeting is March the 9th. It will be at the Convention Center during the Work Truck Show and the Green Truck Summit. That session, um, one of the presentations will be from Beyond Trucks, and they will present on the hidden costs of trucking, how carriers can identify excessive process costs and make changes to enhance operations and save money. Your deadline to nominate your professionals for our SMC awards banquet is March the 10th. The banquet is April the 22nd in Plainfield. We have our first scale visit, the 12th in Richmond. And please note the later date this year for our truck driver and technician competition of June 23rd and 24th. Registration for that will open in April. The competition for the truck drivers will be held at the FedEx facility in Ameriplex. Before I introduce today's speaker, if you have any questions, please use the communication portal and send those questions to myself. We will read them at the end and have Brandon answer them as received. Our presenter today is Brandon Wiseman. Brandon is the owner and president of Truck Safe Consulting and a partner with Childress Law. Today, he will review best practices and processes for submitting a successful data queue challenge. As a transportation attorney, Brandon has assisted some of the nation's leading motor carriers in developing and maintaining compl compliant and cutting edge safety programs. He has also represented carriers of all types and sizes before the FMCSA on matters such as safety rating upgrades and civil penalty proceedings. Through his consulting company, Brandon now offers carrier state of the art compliance resources and regulatory training materials covering a wide range of safety related topics. Brandon is a regular speaker at industry events and contributor to industry publications. And if you are attending the transportation summit next week, he and his partner will discuss autonomous vehicles and what FMCSA will need to do to consider when reviewing current rule and regulation changes for the road. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks, Kelly. Um, appreciate the invite. Looking forward to talking about data cues today. Um, we've got three people here with us live. Um, that's about three more than I usually have watching my presentation. So uh, I used to speak into myself here, so this will be good. Um, but this is an important topic 
Um, obviously, not enough carriers, in my experience, know how to use the data queue system or even know what it is. Uh, it is one of the few ways that, or, or the few tools that carriers have available to them to improve their CSA scores. Uh, no shortage of carriers calling me weekly asking how to improve their CSA scores, and um, you know they would benefit from hearing this type of uh, of um, this type of content. So, uh, regardless, um, important topic. So that's what we're going to spend today talking about. Um, you know, namely, what is what is the data queue system? How is it used? Uh, how can you use it to um, improve your scores? That type of stuff. So, you know, starting things off here, what is data queues? That's the million dollar question. FMCSA describes it this way, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Data Cues is the FMCSA online system where anyone can request review of FMCSA issued data. Data Cues is also a one-stop shop where FMCSA and its state partners go to review and respond to data concerns and have access to the Data Cues user guide and manual. Data Cues helps FMCSA carry out its data quality program that monitors, evaluates, and improves the quality of data that states submit. Um, true to form, FMCSA likes to use uh, a lot of language to say very little, which is, uh, we could summarize this by saying that data cues is essentially uh, an appeal system. It is the way that motor carriers, regulated motor carriers, can appeal erroneous data that gets uploaded to the federal databases, um, namely the um, MCMIS database, Motor Carrier Information Management System, which is the system where all roadside inspection data gets uploaded. So anytime your trucks are traveling down the road and they get pulled over for a roadside inspection and then you get the report that lists out all of the violations, those violations all get uploaded to the MCMIS database and, uh, and get associated with your safety measurement system, SMS account, and that's what drives your CSA scores. So the data queue system is where you go to challenge erroneous data that may be in the system. Um, there are various use cases for the data queue system. And uh, even for carriers that may be aware that the data queue system is where you, you challenge roadside inspection data, they may not know that there are other use cases for the data queue system. So I just wanted to run briefly through what those use cases are. Certainly, number one, uh, the most common use case is challenging erroneous violations from roadside inspections. Officer stops your driver roadside, writes them up for uh, maybe having a, um, missing some key documents in the truck. Maybe they don't have their ELD user manual or, or whatever. Uh, if you've got evidence to prove that the officer got those violations wrong, did something wrong, misinterpreted the law, something to that effect, then data cues is the system that you would use to challenge those. Uh, and we'll talk about what that looks like here in a little bit. But another use case is um, challenging the preventability of accidents. If your driver happens to be involved in an accident, you know, historically, the FMCSA has not taken preventability into account when it puts those on your account. And so, in other words, historically, um, motor carriers have been impacted by all of the DOT recordable accidents that they have incurred, regardless of whether they were their driver's fault or not. Um, obviously, that doesn't seem all that fair, and it's not fair. Um, but I think FMCSA's rationale for what rationale for doing it that way was: well, if we're treating every carrier the same, then no harm, no foul. But uh, more recently, they have come up with what they call their crash preventability demonstration program. You may be familiar with it. Uh, if not, you can Google it and you can find some more information on it. But generally speaking, that is the system where the FMCSA now, in very limited circumstances, will evaluate the preventability of your DOT recordable accidents, and if they agree with you that they were non-preventable on your driver's part, well then they, um, they, that accident won't weigh as heavily on your scores as it would otherwise. And the way that you initiate that crash preventability review is through the data queue system. Uh, if you have reason to believe that one of your accidents fits within the criteria of that crash preventability demonstration program, then you can file a data queue and you request that it be reviewed or and determined to be non-preventable. And then if you succeed in that appeal, uh, then that accident um, 
it'll still show up in your account, but it won't weigh on your your crash indicator score, which is where it's where it gets filtered into currently. Uh, the one thing I'll say on that crash preventability demonstration program, if you're interested in challenging some of the some of your DOT recordable accidents, make sure you uh, search it out on on the FMCSA's website because they've got a list of eligible accidents. As I said, this is a, a pretty limited program for right now. It started out as a pilot program. It's now out of the pilot stage, but it's still limited in scope, meaning that <clears throat> the FMCSA is only going to accept certain types of accidents into the program for consideration of preventability. Uh, it's generally going to be the ones where it's very clearly non-preventable on the commercial driver's parts. Things like um, there's some crazy examples in there, <laughs> but uh, the 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 prime example is going to be where your driver's at a stoplight or a stop sign and gets rear-ended um, by another motorist. That's going to be an accident that qualifies for consideration in the crash preventability program. There are things like, uh, believe it or not, there, one of the listed examples in the crash preventability demonstration program is a situation where um, your driver's commercial motor vehicle is struck by a skydiver, um, if you could believe that or not. So uh, it has to be in there because it had to have come up at some point. But situations like that where it's very clearly not your um, your commercial driver's fault that, that the accident occurred, those are going to be the ones that are eligible for consideration under that crash preventability demonstration program. So data cues, suffice it to say, data cues system is where you initiate that type of challenge. Uh, another use case for data cues would be for drivers themselves, commercial drivers, to challenge violation data that gets put on their PSP records. Uh, you may be familiar with PSP. It's the Pre-Employment Screening Program. This is a program that's administered by the FMCSA. It's a voluntary program for motor carriers. They don't have to subscribe to it. There's a cost associated with it, but it essentially is similar to um, a, a motor vehicle report, an MVR that you would run on a driver, but the PSP reports provide more detail on um, violations, commercial uh, violations incurred by a particular driver while operating a commercial motor vehicle. When you run an MVR, you get data about that driver that is not related to them operating a commercial motor vehicle. You get all of their traffic violations, including those in a personal vehicle. So it's uh, it's useful information, obviously, but of limited use when you're trying to evaluate whether this driver is a good candidate to operate a commercial vehicle for me or not. So that's where PSP reports step in, uh, and they kind of fill that gap. They give me more insight uh, as to what types of commercial uh, vehicle violations this driver has incurred, not just for me, uh, not just while working for me, but for any regulated motor carrier over a certain time frame. So um, there needs to be a system like there is for motor carriers to challenge the um, the veracity of, of a violation. There needs to be a system for drivers to challenge um, those violations as well, and that's through the data queue system. So a driver can set up a data queues account and can challenge information that appears on his or her PSP report so that when they go and apply to another motor carrier to start working for that other carrier, um, you know, that those violations, if they were erroneous, then aren't impacting their ability to get work at another motor carrier. So that's one use case. Another one, this one I don't think enough motor carriers know about, um, and I've had some pretty good success using this for uh, a lot of my clients, is using the data queue system to challenge erroneous violations from a compliance review. So when the DOT comes in and does an audit, they will issue a report that lists out a bunch of violations if they find any. More often than not, they do find uh, violations when they come in. Um, and you know, a lot of motor carriers think that they're stuck with those violations from that compliance review, uh, assuming um, that those violations may not have impacted their safety rating. So you may be, you may know that if you if you get a compliance review, DOT has come in, done an audit, and they um, downgrade your safety rating. There's a, a whole other appeal process that you would follow to challenge the assignment of that safety rating following that audit. Um, that's known as the 38515 or the safety rating upgrade process where you actually file an appeal with the FMCSA's headquarters and you're challenging the assignment of that safety rating. But sometimes you'll get an audit 
and they won't necessarily change your safety rating. It may be a non-rateable review, um, but you still have violations listed on the report, and how do you challenge those if they didn't impact your safety rating? Well, DOT has come out and said that that 385.15 appeal up to headquarters is not the appropriate venue for you to challenge those violations that didn't impact your safety rating. So where do you challenge them? You challenge them through the data queue system, uh, it, it turns out. Um, and so there, as we'll see in a little bit, there's a specific option for you if you've been audited to go into the data queue system and, and challenge the investigator's findings from the audit. Uh, so that's an important use case for the data queue system. And then lastly, um, the system can be used for um, kind of more innocuous things like requesting a, a roadside inspection report if for whatever reason your driver didn't get a copy or you lost a copy or whatever, you would go in and file a data queue to request a, a, a copy of that report. So several use cases that not a lot of people are familiar with when it comes to data queues. Um, next thing I want to talk about is who are the stakeholders of the data queue system? Uh, who uses the system? Um, you may be surprised to know that anyone, literally anyone, can file a data queues appeal um, or, or otherwise known as a request for data review in RDR. It doesn't just have to be the carrier or the driver who is impacted by that violation. It could be anybody. Uh, I regularly file data queues through my own data queues account on behalf of my motor carrier clients. In that situation, I'm just a third party that's, that's challenging um, a particular violation on a on a on a inspection report. You don't have to be a motor carrier, uh, or and you don't have to be a driver to file those challenges. Anyone can. Now, with that said, when you register for a data queues account, it asks you um, in what capacity you will be filing appeals. Uh, and it, it lists out a, a bunch of different options. If you if you say that you're a motor carrier, it'll ask you for your DOT number. And then if um, if you enter your DOT number, then you will become essentially a verified motor carrier so that when you file a data queue appeal, the person reviewing the appeal knows that it's a verified account and, uh, and, and maybe they give it a little bit more weight because of that. But frankly, I've never had any trouble filing it as a third party on behalf of of my motor care clients. And so um, just know that that uh, you don't have to be a motor carrier to file a request for data review. You could be anybody uh, filing it on their behalf or just filing it because you think DOT got something wrong. Um, it, it does happen. Um, who else uses the data queue system? Well, in most cases, a state anal analyst will review and rule on your request for data review. Um, this is one of the big criticisms criticisms of the data queue system. It's one that I've had uh, problems with um, since data queue system was first rolled out with the broader CSA program back in 2010, um, is this kind of concept of due process. We, you would like to think that if an officer uh, writes you up for a violation roadside and they got something wrong, uh, that led them to issue that violation, you would like to think that there is a process available to you where you get to appeal that up to a higher authority. You know, we kind of think of it as akin to the court system, where if I disagree with the lower court, the trial court, then I could I could get another bite at the apple by appealing that decision up to a, a higher authority, a court of appeals, for example. That's not how the data queue system works, unfortunately. Um, there is very little due process uh, in this system, um, and I think it needs to change. But um, apparently people don't really care what I have to think because I've, I've expressed this concern for many years, and we still have the problem. Uh, your appeal through the data queue system is going to be reviewed in most cases by the very same agency that issued the violation in the first place. In most cases, in a lot of cases, it will be the very same officer that wrote you up for the violation. Um, and you can imagine how that plays out. You're telling the officer that he got something wrong. Is he gonna be inclined to change his mind? Uh, maybe, um, and it certainly does happen. If you pre present convincing evidence that he got something wrong, well then maybe he changes his mind, but uh, it's just uh, within our nature to not believe that we got something wrong. And so that's the problem, big problem with the data queue system is you file the appeal it often goes back to the same officer that wrote the appeal. And so um, a lot of times he's disinclined to change his mind. Um, but that's not always the case. So we could talk about this later. Um, 
but there are situations where I have requested on behalf of my clients that, you know, after the, the officer or the state agency that uh, is reviewing the first level appeal through the data queue system, they, they, they deny my appeal. I usually go back in and request that it be escalated up to FMCSA. Now there's nothing that compels them to, uh, to do that, to escalate it to FMCSA, but I have had some success in, in requesting a closer review by the FMCSA itself. And sometimes they will acquiesce to that request and they'll get FMCSA involved and then maybe FMCSA will weigh in. Um, but just know that that's a rare case. More often than not, it's going to be the state agency that issued the uh, violation that's going to be reviewing your appeal. So if I got stopped by Indiana State Police, uh, and he wrote me up for a medical card violation, for example, then when I f appeal that violation, it's going to be reviewed by the Indiana State Police, and that's just how it works. Um, yeah, so that last bullet point there is kind of what I was talking about, except for certain types of requests for data review, namely the accident prevent preventability program that I mentioned earlier, except in that case, it's most often going to be FMCSA taking a hands-off approach to this. They don't like to get involved, even though this is their platform, this is their system. Uh, they, they rarely get involved. And so um, if there's any good news here, it's, um, you know, we kind of think of the relationship between the state agency, state law enforcement, and FMCSA. The way that that works is that um, the reason we have state agencies enforcing federal law to begin with is because of what's called the MCSAP program, MCSAP, Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program. Uh, this is a program that's been in place for a long time. It's essentially a, uh, a way for states to get federal funding for the enforcement of their, or, or for the implementation of their state motor carrier safety uh, programs. And in exchange for getting funds from the federal government like that, the states agree to adopt and enforce the federal rules. And so that's, we have this relationship between state law enforcement and the FMCSA, um, whereby we, we rely on the states to enforce federal laws, because as you probably know, FMCSA, generally speaking, is a pretty small agency uh, as federal agencies go. Uh, and so it just doesn't have the manpower itself to uh, to reach any significant percentage of the universe of motor carriers that it's charged with regulating. So it relies a lot on its state partners to enforce these laws. And uh, this is just another way uh, in which the states are incorporated into the process. They are the ones that are having to review these data cues. And uh, maybe if a state goes rogue and, and uh, is not interpreting the federal laws the way that they should be. Maybe FMCSA comes in and slaps them on the wrist, um, but more often than not, you're going to be dealing with the states. Uh, so let's talk about um, actually filing the the requests for data reviews, the RDRs through the data queue system, and some uh, some things you may want to know as you go through that process. First thing to know is that there are several RDR type types that you can file. Uh, this is a screenshot from the data queue system. Um, it was just recently updated within the last couple of months. It didn't used to look like this, but this is how it looks currently. If you once you go in and set up an account, which is very easy to do, to do, you just register your email address for a data queues account. Uh, this will be the home screen that you'll see when you log in. And the first thing, very first thing you have to do is you have to tell the system what it is that you're trying to do. What type of request for data review are you trying to file? Now, I mentioned earlier some of the various use cases. This is kind of where that comes into play, um, but we'll break it down a little bit more here um, when it comes to the specific RDR types. And there are a couple of types um, that are the most commonly used types, but it's important that you pick the right one because if you pick the wrong RDR type and you proceed with filing it uh, and it turns out that it was the wrong type, then you, then your request is probably just going to get denied and, and you're going to have to refile it. So understanding at the outset what type of RDR I should be filing is important. So here are the various types that are available to you and I've highlighted in orange the ones that are the most common types that you would be filing. So let's start out with the crash type. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the data queue system is the system where you challenge the preventability of your crashes if you want to do that. The crash um, 
crash preventability demonstration program. So you can see here that even under that crash type, there are uh, a handful of different options available to you. So I'll just run through these quickly. Uh, first would be um, not mine. <laughs> uh, you'll see this come up in, a, in uh, a couple of the categories here where you file a request for data review saying, hey, you somehow implicated me in this inspection or this crash, and I wasn't even involved. That happens, believe it or not, pretty frequently, where maybe the officer just um, put down the wrong DOT number uh, or something like that, and so it gets put on your account, but you had nothing to do with that crash or that accident. That's where you would go into the data queue system and you would file a not mine um, RDR type, whether it be for a crash or an inspection. It happens pretty regularly with roadside inspections where the officer just jots the DOT number down incorrectly and then it ends up on your account. So you have to go in and file a request for data review so hey, that wasn't mine. Um, so that's one type. Um, another type would be uh, for the crash specifically is if you are challenging um, the nature of the crash to begin with. There are only certain types of crashes that impact a motor carrier's safety metrics, and those are called DOT recordable crashes. You're probably familiar with these. These are uh, crashes that involve a fatality, certainly. Any crash involving a fatality would be a DOT recordable crash. But then there are also two other types of crashes that qualify as DOT recordable. The first is any crash involving an injury to any person that requires immediate medical attention away from the scene of the accident. So if any of the involved parties has to be transported away from the scene and receives immediate medical attention for their injuries, that would be a DOT recordable crash and that would impact your, uh, your safety metrics. And then the last category of DOT recordable crashes are those in which any of the vehicles involved has to be towed away from the scene because of disabling damage. So those are the three categories of DOT uh, recordable crashes. If your driver is involved in a crash that doesn't meet that criteria, but somehow that crash ends up on your account, then you would go into the data queue system and file a, a data queue appeal saying, hey, this type of accident didn't qualify as a DOT recordable crash, and show, so it should not be impacting my scores. Good example is... Um, if the crash, uh, if your vehicle's involved in a crash and you, um, you voluntarily have it towed from the scene, the vehicle could move on its own. In other words, it didn't incur disabling damage, but just to be safe, you're going to have it towed from the scene anyway. If you have evidence that that was the case, that there wasn't actually disabling damage and you just had it towed from the scene uh, for, for whatever reason, then you could file a data queue and maybe get that taken off your account because that really shouldn't qualify as a DOT recordable crash. So that's a, another a, a pretty commonly used data queues in the crash category. Uh, duplicates. Uh, you'll see this come up in a couple of the categories as well, where sometimes, for whatever reason, the system includes the same crash twice or the same roadside inspection twice on your account. So now it's having twice the weight on your scores, uh, and it turns out that it was just a mistake that got entered into the system twice. So then you can go in and file a, a request for data review saying it's a duplicate uh, and, and have it removed. And then we get to the most common uh, crash RDR type, which is that... Uh, the crash was non-preventable, or it fits within that criteria that I mentioned for a uh, crash preventability demonstration program. That would That's far and away the most common crash-related RDR type that you would file through the data queue system. Um, then let's, uh, let's see, do I have another slide here? Yeah, this is the crash preventability determination, uh, not demonstration, determination program. Uh, so if you were to look it up on FMCSA's website, this is their web page. Uh, it explains the process, and um, and it includes that eligibility guide. You could see that link there. So I recommend, uh, if you're not familiar with this program, go to the FMCSA's website, look for this Crash Preventability Determination Program, download that eligibility guide. Here are uh, Here's the list of crashes that are eligible for consideration under that program. Um, you could see things like struck in, re in the rear, which is the one I mentioned, and there are a handful of others that would be eligible for that program, including like animal strikes, that type of stuff. Uh, so moving on then to inspections. The inspection RDR types are far and away the most common use of the data queue system, as I mentioned. 
um, it can be filed. Uh, these types of RDRs can be filed for a, a number of reasons. Let's go through them here. First up is to get a copy of the report. I mentioned that early on. If you're missing, for whatever reason, a copy of the roadside inspection report and you just want a copy of it, well, then you would go into your data queues account and you would request a copy through the, uh, through the inspection RDR type. Then the next two are the most common within the inspection RDR types. I'm going to skip over adjudicated citation for a minute and get to the violation in, is incorrect. Far and away, this is the most common use of data cues. This is a situation where your driver is stopped for an inspection and the officer writes up a violation, either a driver-related violation or a vehicle-related violation, and you have some reason to believe that the officer got that wrong. You should not have been uh, written up for a particular violation. That's when you would go into the system and you would file this violation is incorrect inspection type RDR. Uh, and uh, we'll get to some best uh, practices here in a minute. I'll give you some tips on how to file an effective data queue. Um, but just know for now that the violation is incorrect is going to be um, the most common, your most common use of the data queue system in most cases. Now going back to the adjudicated citation um, RDR type, this is one that uh, in my experience not enough carriers take advantage of. So the, da the, da the data queue system has uh, the option for you to come into the system and to challenge a violation that is still on your account after that violation has been adjudicated by a state court. You know, certainly not every time that your driver gets, um, uh, receives violations from a roadside inspection does that have an a actual state citation, a ticket associated with it, but a lot of them do. You know, sometimes it's just a warning. But what many carriers don't realize is that even though it's just a warning, those violations are still filtering into your CSA scores and they're impacting your CSA scores. So if there's no citation associated with it, it's just a warning, you still may have um, a reason to come in there and file a violation is incorrect RDR if the officer got it wrong. But the... the uh, benefit of having an associated citation. You may think of that as the worst case scenario. My driver also receives a ticket for that violation. Now there's a court date associated with it. But the benefit of having that type of violation is that if you can successfully get that violation dismissed at the state court level, uh, and not even necessarily having to go to court. Sometimes you can just work with a prosecutor and get that either dismissed or changed to a lesser violation. If you get that done on the state court side of things, then it's pretty simple to get the associated violation taken off your CSA scores through the data queue system through this adjudicated citation uh, option. You're essentially telling FMCSA, hey, listen, we had a state court weigh in on this and we got it dismissed on the state court side of things. Uh, and then it's kind of just a pro forma issue at that point. The, uh, you file your data queue, you, you submit evidence that the issue has been adjudicated by the state, and then the FMCSA really has no discretion at that point. If it was dismissed by the state, then the FMCSA has to come in and, and likewise dismiss it or remove it from your CSA scores. So what I found and what my recommendation to most carriers is, is if they get a violation where there's an associated state citation, uh, try and get that resolved at the state level first. You don't have to, but it's it's a lot easier, as I just demonstrated, to get it removed if you can get it adjudicated in your favor at the state level. Now, there is some nuance to this. So this is um, what we're looking at here is uh, information from the FMCSA's Data Cues Analyst Guide. This is kind of the instruction manual uh, to the Data Cues system. You can see here that they've listed out um, the what happens based on um, how your citation was adjudicated. You can see here that on the left kind of lists the outcome of the state citation and then, and then on the right it lists what's going to happen in uh, in the CSA system based on that result. And you could see that if you are successful in getting your um, citation dismissed without a fine or just a finding of not guilty on the state side of things, then that violation is going to be automatically, uh, not automatic. I shouldn't say automatically, you still got to file the data queue, but it will be removed from your CSA score. So you, you get it dismissed or you get found not guilty by a state court, um, and then you file the data queue and then the violation will be removed from your CSA scores. If you don't take that step of filing the data queue, even though you got it removed on the state court side of things, it will still show up in the system 
in the CSA system unless and until you go in and file that data queue. But that's the result of a dismissed um, uh, state citation. But what happens if you um, if you negotiate a uh, some resolution to that citation that is short of getting it dismissed? This is pretty common where maybe you get cited for operating a vehicle without a CDL when one was required, but you convince the prosecutor to make that some other type of violation. It sounds crazy, but sometimes you'll get you'll get the prosecutor to agree to change the violation to something altogether, something entirely different. Uh, it, it often makes no sense. I've seen violations like that gets changed to like a parking, uh, a non-moving violation, that type of stuff. It's just sometimes that happens. Um, but what you need to know for purposes of our discussion today is that if you get the, the court or the prosecutor to agree to convicting your driver of a different charge than what he was originally cited for, then the implication on, this, on the CSA side of things is that the violation will be notated as being convicted of a different charge and the severity weight of that violation will be dropped to one. Uh, and that's a pretty significant um, change. It, it's not going to be removed from your account altogether, but the severity is going to be reduced to one. Um, and if you know anything about the uh, the safety measurement system methodology, <clears throat> you'll know that uh, violations have a severity weight of between one and ten, depending on how serious a violation it is. Uh, obviously, the more serious violations have a greater weight, uh, and so if you ha are, if you're staring down the barrel of a violation that has a severity weight of 10, that can have a big impact on your CSA scores. So if there's a citation associated with it, and, and you're able to convince the prosecutor to downgrade that to a lesser charge, well then you could go in and file a data queue and say and and demonstrate that the driver was cited uh, or convicted of a different charge, and then that that severity weight will drop from 10 down to one and then it will have less of an impact on your CSA scores which is always important so that's another option and then the last option is if if you get convicted if your driver gets convicted of um, uh, of the violation that he was charged with or if you get it dismissed but you still have to pay a fine in other words you're you're just paying the fine to get out of the traffic ticket well then the violation is going to remain the same on your CSA scores so there's really no point in filing a data queue in those situations so if you're just paying you're saying hey I just want to be done with that ticket I'm just going to pay whatever the associated fine is well then you're essentially admitting to the violation and you're paying the fine and so on the CSA side of things nothing's going to change about how that's impacting your CSA scores so those are the options when it comes to um, the adjudicated citations option in the data queue RDR types um, just to mention a few others here, um, I, I think we've kind of hit all of the crash and the inspection RDR types. There's a few other types, as I mentioned at the start. Um, there are some options available to you uh, following an audit. If you get audited by the FMCSA or one of its state partners uh, and there's something wrong about uh, the report that you get, including erroneous violations listed on that report, um, you can go in and you could file an audit RDR type where you are challenging um, a violation that was listed on your audit report, uh, whether it be a safety audit or a compliance review, um, uh, stuff like that. Um, that's what you would use that audit RDR type in the data queue system. Uh, then moving on to registration, this is just some, this is a very uh, uncommon RDR type, but certainly if you're faced with one of these situations, then you may want to file a data queue. Uh, for example, if you're, uh, if for whatever reason your registration information with the FMCSA uh, is showing incorrect information, so for example, um, you know you file your MCS 150s every other year where you're listing out. Um, you're listing out basic registration details like your fleet size and your address and your contact details uh, and your cargo, the type of cargo you haul. Uh, if for whatever reason that information gets screwed up and is showing incorrectly in the system, then technically you could file a data queue and try and get the agency to change that. I don't know why you wouldn't just reach out to FMCSA, frankly, and ask them to fix whatever it is that they screwed up in those situations. That's usually how I handle registration problems. But there is an option in data queues, I guess, that you could follow. But I've had a lot more success just reaching out to FMCSA's registration office and getting those issues fixed. Uh, same thing with operating authority 
uh, issues and insurance info. Um, so those are options to you in DataQ, but not all that um, common to, to file those. Lastly is the clearinghouse RDR type. This is the uh, a more recent development with the DataQ system because the drug and alcohol clearinghouse is uh, a fairly recent uh, part of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. This is the system or the database now where all drug and alcohol violation data for all CDL drivers is housed. So if a driver tests positive for drugs or alcohol, a CDL driver, then information about that positive test gets uploaded to the clearinghouse. And then when that driver goes and tries to get another job somewhere else, then that new prospective employer checks the clearinghouse to see what information is in it about that driver. Well, if information uh, that's in the clearinghouse about a particular driver is wrong, then we need a, a place for that driver to challenge that information, or a carrier, frankly. Uh, and so now there is an option, a specific RDR type for motor carriers to go in, or drivers to go in and, um, and challenge inaccurate violation information within the clearinghouse. So uh, just know that. Um, so that's it for the various RDR types. Um, this is ju just a screenshot here of what it, what the system looks like after you have filed your request for data review. As I said, you file the request, it goes in, then the state begins reviewing it, and then they will upload their response back to the system. Uh, what you're looking at here is just my, this is from my account. These are the various RDRs that I have filed. Um, recently and you can see that it lists out every one that you file and it'll give you like a status update. Now if you have an RDR, uh, data queue account you'll also get emails if anything changes about one of the RDRs that you'll file so uh, you don't necessarily have to be monitoring this on a daily basis you'll get an email through the system if something changes if the status of your request has changed. Uh, for example if you get a response from the state um, it will show up here, but it, you'll also get an email about it. So that's just what I'm showing here is how this will look once you start making um, requests for data reviews within the data queue system. That's how it'll look. All right, so uh, kind of wrapping up here, um, let's talk about some questions that I get pretty frequently from, from folks about the data queue system. Um, First and foremost is that due process question. Uh, who exactly is reviewing and ruling on my request? I kind of already tackled that at the beginning. It's going to be uh, usually the state agency that issued the violation in the first place that is going to be reviewing your request. Um, there, are, there are limited circumstances where it's going to be the FMCSA. For example, if you challenge a violation from a, an FMCSA compliance review, well, then it's going to be the FMCSA investigator that, that conducted that review that's reviewing your data queue challenge. Uh, same thing with the crash preventability demonstration program. Those are reviewed by a committee uh, of folks that include FMCSA officials on that committee. So those are going to be reviewed by FMCSA. But when it just comes to challenging roadside inspection violation data, that's going to be reviewed by the state agency that issued it. How long does it take to receive a response to a data queue? Pretty common question. Uh, it varies um, pretty wildly in my experience based on the state that is reviewing it. Again, this is largely a state-administered program, even though it's the FMCSA system, and it, it's largely dependent on uh, how backed up that particular state is in, in terms of reviewing uh, data queues. What I found is that the states that have a lot more um, commercial vehicle activity are going to be the ones where it takes longer to get a response just because there's, they've got so many to deal with. Um, whereas states where there's very little, uh, relatively speaking, commercial vehicle activity, then you'll tend to get a quicker response. But at the same time, often those states have fewer people devoted to this task, whereas states that have a lot of activity will have more people devoted, usually speak, uh, generally speaking. And so all that's to say is it varies pretty wildly. I think the Data Queue Analyst Guide recommends that the states get back to you within a couple of weeks. And, and sometimes that's the case. A lot of times you'll get a response back within a couple of weeks. But I've had situations where it has lingered on for months um, and we've gotten no response. I just had one recently where uh, despite me um, poking them every couple of weeks and bugging them trying to get a response, it took five months to get a response to a data, what, would I, what I consider just a routine data queue appeal. So uh, it could take a while. Um, 
can I file a response? Yes, as I said at the start, anybody can file a data queue appeal, uh, provided you've got information um, that you need to to pull up the violation that you're trying to appeal. Namely, if you're if you're trying to challenge a violation that was listed on a roadside inspection report, then you're going to want to have a copy of that roadside inspection report because the way that you pull it up in the system is by typing in the inspection number. And uh, if you don't have that, then you're not going to be able to tell the system um, the information it needs to pull up that that violation. So, yes, anybody can file a, a data queue appeal. Uh, when should you file the appeal? There's no hard and fast rule here. Um, Usually I recommend that you file it no later than 30 days after the violation was discovered. So if you get a roadside inspection report um, you know, or a violation is noted on February 1st, you can try and, try and get it filed uh, before the end of the month. I don't think you need to file it immediately after, but just know that you know when you're filing an appeal, memories fade, and so you're, the evidence that you're going to have available to you to submit to support your case for getting the violation removed uh, becomes um, it can become less valuable to you over time as, as time goes. So, you know, maybe the officer forgets about the issues, so he's less inclined to uh, change his, his mind on that. So what I usually try and shoot for is getting them filed within the first 30 days. Um, there's nothing that prevents you from doing it after that time frame. I just think that's a good rule of thumb. All right, we'll finish up here with best practices. Some tips that I've learned over the years uh, after filing literally hundreds of these at these point. Um, number one is pick your battles. You know, I'll encounter a, a couple of different types of carriers. You've got carriers on the one hand who like to challenge every single violation that's discovered roadside. They will just, as a matter of course, file an appeal, whether they have a good reason to file the appeal or not. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got carriers who never use the system whatsoever. I think you need to fall somewhere in between. You need, to, you need to pick your battles. You need to choose the violations that you have a good faith belief that the officer got something wrong. Those are the ones you need to target for appeal. I don't think it does you any good uh, to challenge every violation. In fact, I think it hurts your reputation. It's kind of the boy who calls wolf type situation here. If you are constantly filing appeals, um, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be viewed as someone who... Um, who, who just does that, who has no good faith basis to challenge these, and so we're just going to deny the request when they come in. So don't be that carrier. I've never found that to be an effective use of the data queue system. But on the other end of the spectrum, don't be the carrier that just doesn't do anything because there are going to be situations where an officer gets something wrong, uh, and you're going to want to challenge that because otherwise those erroneous violations are going to negatively impact your CSA scores, and as your CSA scores uh, degrade, then you're putting a target on your back for DOT enforcement. Uh, you're putting a target on your back for highway accident litigation exposure. Uh, and it's also impacting your customer relationships. So there are a lot of reasons why you want to keep on top of this stuff and to uh, make use of the system when it would work to your benefit. So pick your battles wisely. That's my first tip. Second tip here is evidence is your friend. And what I mean by that is when you do file an appeal, you better make sure you've got some evidence to back up your basis for the appeal. What I found is that if you are just filing an appeal and saying the officer got this wrong, and that's the, that's the gist of your appeal, officer screwed this up, you're going to lose that battle 99.9% .9 of the time. The ones where you have a chance of success is when you are able to provide concrete evidence to back up your version of the facts or the law. And so, you know, a good example, I did one not too long ago where a driver was cited for operating a commercial motor vehicle in the fast lane. Uh, officer was taking the position that he should have moved over to his right, and so he got written up for that. But we had video evidence, luckily in that case, from the driver's um, cameras that were installed in his commercial motor vehicle showing that his intent of being why he was in the left hand lane was because his intent was to exit uh, to the left at an upcoming exit that's where he needed to exit the highway and it happened to be on the left hand side of the road so we had video evidence that we submitted with that data queue appeal and we were able to get that one overturned it's those situations where you've got that type of evidence to back up your claims that's when you're going to have the best uh, chance of success that's not to say that you're going to win those all the time um, you're, there's still going to be situations where despite your best evidence 
uh, the officer's still going to disagree and you're just going to have to deal with those as they come. But what I found is that, um, it's almost not even worth submitting an appeal if you don't have some kind of evidence to back up your claim. What kind of evidence? Well, certainly video evidence helps in a lot of cases, but you know, any kind of documentation you've got to prove your version of the facts, even if it is nothing more than a, um, some kind of an affidavit or a declaration from your drivers where the driver is, is um, saying this is what happened during the, uh, during the roadside inspection and this is why the officer got it wrong and then the driver signs it, you know, uh, essentially under oath. It's not really under oath, but is signing it under penalties of perjury. That's better than nothing. So um, just th that's, that's the tip there is make sure you have evidence to back up your claims. Uh, the next one is just kind of that citations issue that we mentioned earlier. My recommendation to you is if there's a ticket associated with a violation, adjudicate that citation first, that ticket first, because it will be much easier on the back end if you can get that resolved at the state level to get it removed on, through the data queue system. Uh, understand the crash preventability criteria. We've already talked about that. Excruciating detail. What I found is that when carriers come to me and say, hey, can you help me? We filed a data queue, but... Uh, it got denied. When I go in and look at that, it's because they put very little detail uh, in in their data queue uh, appeal. You know, when you go to file it, it'll it'll bring up a web form where you just t you could type in the basis for your appeal. I never use that, uh, and a lot of motor carriers use that. They just type in their appeal. I've never liked using that uh, just that web form. What I do instead is I draft up a detailed letter on my letterhead where I walk through my arguments step by step and I make citations and I bold some text and I, I underline text and all the things you would do when you're trying to make your case in other contexts, I do that in a letter and then I just attach the letter as my appeal to that RDR. Rather than trying to type it, fit it all in the web form where you have no control over the formatting, you, a lot gets lost when you try and do it that way. So the point here is be, uh, be very detailed in your appeals. And then carefully, uh, lastly, carefully watch your SMS data. Make sure you are logging into your safety measurement system account at least monthly to check and see what violations are contributing to your scores and see which ones may be good candidates fi for filing those data cues appeals. That's uh, that above anything. Uh, that's that's my number one recommendation. Uh, and that's it. Um, right on time here. Looks like. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions, but I'll certainly uh, open it up here now if anybody does have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. We have a small group. If anybody has any questions, if they just want to unmute and ask the question instead of typing it out, that's completely fine. Not seeing anyone unmuting. I don't think we have any questions, Brandon. I I, I, I lulled them all to sleep. <laughs> nope, I don't think so. I'll, we just had some thank yous. Um, that you did a great job. I will reiterate what you were saying about don't cry wolf. I have had the troopers here that review the data cues tell me that verbatim. And there are carriers that do that, that they just rarely even look at their data cues anymore because nine times out of 10, they're not worthy of review. So take that into consideration when you're submitting and um, thank you again, Brandon, for this content. I think it's a wonderful topic and way to help our members really understand how they can potentially improve their scores and they have to stay on that. No worries. And then my contact information is there. If anybody has any questions for me, feel free to reach out. Wonderful. I will have this um, will probably be posted before the end of the week. If anybody cares to have the recording, it will be um, posted and sent out uh, before the end of the week. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for Thank joining. Everyone.